Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And Frank from Tested. Frank, it's been a while since we've done a project in the shop uh, for everyone, and I thought it'd be fun to revisit some simple dump molds. Yeah, um, I have been wanting to recreate some of these uh, old tools from my dad's toolbox for a while. They just have a lot of flavor to them, and they're nice and worn, and these will be really fun to paint. So I think we should um, make these. Yeah, and maybe one way to make them isn't to use cast them in like a hard rubber or resin, but yeah. I think you maybe want to make a prop that you can just throw around. Yeah, um, like a stunt prop. Yes. So like if you were in a movie or you were filming something, you don't want to have an actor swinging around an ax, mm -hmm. make a rubber one. Ah, so uh, what type of material uh, do you want to cast this out of? Because there's um, so many. We'll probably cast these out of um, like a, a self-skinning foam. So it's a poly foam. That, that makes itself a nice skin. Like there's some polyfoams that don't skin really well, and there's other like materials you could put in and then back it with polyfoam, but um, we'll use a polyfoam that makes its own skin. I imagine that's gonna be lightweight, mm -hmm. but then because it has a skin, you can finish it and paint it as yeah. if it was a hard resin. Yeah. Very cool. We may be getting ahead of ourselves because step one is gonna be making molds of these things. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get started making the molds, and then I'm gonna ask questions so you guys can follow along and learn how to make molds and replicas your workshop tools. All right, so how big do you want to make your box for, for these dump molds? Um, you know, kind of rule of thumb is about a half an inch to an inch bigger than the, than the, than the piece. Um, I want to also kind of pay attention to where I'm going to cut the mold open. I want to give myself a little bit more room in some of those. So that's where I would go about an inch away from the piece. Um, but generally, these are like half an inch, three quarters of an inch away from the piece. If you make the, the silicone too thin, it'll be kind of floppy and it'll have a better chance of deforming. If you make it too thick, you're just wasting rubber. Right, and you're also looking at the volume and the shape of the thing you're molding. Here, it's top heavy. We're talking about these tools like a hammer. Mm -hmm. And you're also looking at where that opening is going to be. So is the yeah. opening going to be at the top of the hammer or at the handle? Yeah. Um, you want to do what's going to make sense for how to pour it well so you can get the material into the mold quick enough. Um, and then also how to not disturb too much of the detail. Um, you know, there's there's some a lot of really nice details like on the bottom of this axe, there's these nice little rivets and you know, there's stuff like that. I, I don't wanna clog up those things by putting a pour spout. So first step, getting these tools locked in onto your surface where the yeah. spout is yep. and how you're adhering it. Um, well, a little dab of super glue is kind of really good for giving it that initial kind of lockdown and then I'll uh, you know, put a little bit of uh, hot glue around there to kind of give it a wider base and kind of grab it a little bit more. On the hammer, it's um, it's easier for me to just kind of put a big glob of hot glue down there because, you know, the end of the hammer, there really isn't much that I'm obstructing as far as detail. Um, and to cut that off with a, you know, with an X-Acto knife is really easy. Um, on the axe, it's a little trickier because it's kind of sitting on this corner of the handle. Um, and then also the top of that axe handle is tricky, so I have to, I, I have to cut a piece of wood so that it kind of has a support, mm. um, which will also kind of serve as um, not really a pour spout, but just like a, a place for the material to escape to so that, that you can make sure to get that corner of the ax. And you want to keep these objects as stable mm -hmm. and as level as possible. Um, yeah, stability is really the key because once you start pouring that silicone in there, that's, that's a pretty viscous material and it can move your part around really easily. So if you don't have it locked down to the base well, um, and then if you don't have it stable, it's gonna it's gonna sway and maybe even break off from the base and then float float or sink or just get, become dislodged and then you've ruined you've wasted a bunch of rubber. Um, so an easy way to do this, which is something I learned back when I worked at McFarland Toys, was to just put pins into the foam core and just you know just barely touch that little piece and it'll it'll kind of help stabilize it. And, you know, super glue the pin in into place, and then that that's just enough to kind of keep it from for moving too much. You right. still gotta be careful when you're pouring the rubber in, but it, it just helps stabilize it a tiny bit. And it's just that, that tiny head of the pin touching the part is not enough to like really, you know, make material leak out in any significant way or, I mean, it's, it's fine. You just take the pin out of the mold after it's done and, you know, I mean, if you're really worried about it, you could put a little rubber on there and seal it up like some silicone caulking, but it'll, it's not really a big deal. So you've wrapped the foam core around the objects and I can see, yep, a couple, like maybe, Half inch on the uh, around the edge on the biggest parts mm -hmm. of the object. Uh, stabilize it with pins. I also like for the foam core you scored it so it's not four different pieces. It's yeah. just one piece you can wrap around yeah. and duct tape the edges. Yeah, if you know the box, you know the height of your box. You just cut a long strip and then you know, you, you just have to have some forethought to to know the size of your box. And it's just it's faster to put the box together that way. 
Okay, and then now you're wrapping plaster bandages around yeah. it. And this, like you said, is to keep that silicone from um, bowing the sides yeah. of your box. Yeah, I also put a little bit of duct tape around the corners. Uh, I'm not really worried about these things splitting because they're you know wrapped in, in plaster bandage, but it just kind of helps, I, I guess, peace of mind that little leaks wouldn't come out of the, the corners because sometimes when you score it, you'll get a, you'll get a little hole and it'll leak and it's, it's a pain in the butt. Now, if someone doesn't have plaster bandages, can they reinforce the side to something else, like pieces of wood or just well, having yeah. books or? P pieces of wood, if you put two pieces of wood on, the, on the, the big sides and then duct tape around it, that'll help. Um, I mean, at that point, you might as well just have made the box out of wood. But then it's a little tricky to put a, a pin through the wood. So, you know, you just have to kind of weigh all of these options and, and there's a lot of variables. Okay, so these are the two molds. Yeah, well, the two mold boxes. The two mold boxes. The molds aren't there yet. The nope. molds are made of the silicone rubber, of course. Yeah. Uh, so what type of silicone rubber are you using? Um, I'm just going to use Mold Max 30. We don't need to use anything fancy. It's just a tin-based kind of general use rubber. You know, places, all the, you know, silicone companies have a gajillion kinds of rubber. We don't need anything fancy for this. Doesn't need to be platinum. Doesn't need to be high or low viscosity. Doesn't need to be clear. So just Mold Max 30 is fine. All right, uh, you got your smooth on buckets. Yep. Now you want to mix the right amount to fill the volume here. Yep. What's your technique for that? Um, so you calculate the volume, which is length times width times height. Um, and then a while ago, we, we, we came up with this number 18.5, and that's usually got me pretty close. Like all the different rubbers have different, um, I guess the specific gravity is the number uh, that tells you how much like that rubber weighs in a certain amount of volume. Um, but 18.5 has always been a good number for me to use, and it gets me really close. So what are you multiplying by 18.5? Length times width times height times 18.5, and that'll give you um, a total gram weight of how much rubber you need to do. So for this tall one, it's 15 by 8 by 3, and times 18.5 is 6,660. So I'll, you, you can kind of estimate, you can take a little bit away to estimate for the part that's in there. So I'll probably just... Um, do like 6,600 grams for this. Okay. And then the hammer ends up being out uh, about 3,800 grams. So I'll just, you know, measure about and add those together and make a big batch of rubber. All right, time to get mixing. Yep. Frank, that's some good looking goo. Uh, nice made. pink nightmare. Oh, okay. So let's talk about what you just did because you mixed a lot of silicone. Yeah. Not hand mixed. Yeah, uh, I used a big half inch drill and a big mixer bit. Um, it just makes it quicker to mix all that rubber. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone was making a smaller dump mold, you can just mix your part A, part B, and yeah, use, do it by hand. Do it by hand. Oh, yeah. uh, and then you put it through a process of evacuating the mold. Uh, what does that do? Um, what it does is it pulls out all of the air that I just whipped into the rubber. Um, it's not 100% necessary because we're not going to probably ever pressure cast these pieces. Um, but just rule of thumb, I just typically... Uh, evacuate all the rubbers I ever, I ever do. Um, just makes the molds better. Um, and who knows? Maybe one of these days I do want to run one uh, out of plastic and pressure cast it. I don't know. Um, so now I'm just kind of like slowly uh, pouring all this rubber into these boxes. And the way you're pouring in, um, you're trying to not hit the object. Well, I'm trying to not disrupt the object, and if I start um, putting this, like putting it on the object or pouring it too quickly, um, it's it's more uh, likely to kind of disrupt the piece. Um, you want it to rise in the bottom, stabilize in the bottom. Yeah, I want it to kind of rise up evenly, and uh, it looks like I might need to make a little bit more rubber. I didn't I didn't completely follow my formula. I made a little bit less than I needed, just in case. Um, so it looks like I make another thousand grams. So with this Mold Max 30, yeah. um, do you have enough time to make another batch and combine the two and that's okay? The, the yeah, pot life is different from like adding uh, a, another, uh, another batch of rubber on top of it. Um, like pot life is more how much time I have to get this batch into the mold before it starts uh, becoming too viscous, mm. um, you know, from setting. So, and so it's okay, totally, to use up all the silicone you have in yeah. this batch and then fill up the rest of the mold for yeah. another batch and it'll still be one piece. Yeah, no, 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 there's plenty of time to, to make another batch. 
Silicone's in the mold, and Frank, I can see some Boeing yeah. a little bit at the top. Wow. It, it would be a lot worse if we didn't have this plaster bandage on there. And if that happens, what what could possibly happen? Well, How could that ruin the mold? It could it could dislodge the mold box down at the bottom, mm -hmm. and then you could spring a leak. And okay. It does happen occasionally. I mean, I, I try for that to not happen. Yep. Um, but every once in a while, like if the, if the board has a little bit of silicone or spray release on it from a previous project, you know, the this stuff might not stick to the board real well. So every once in a while, like things happen. Or could deform the mold. So. Well, if if it's too bowed, then when you try and put it back together, if you want to put a board on there or something to to keep the the seams closed, the the board doesn't sit on there real flat. Or uh. you know, there's. You just you always want to have the, the molds nice and square and nice and straight and you know take a little pride in your mold making. Okay, so at this point we got this set, but the working time, how long is the working time? It's about this? 45 minutes of working time. So this isn't like a crazy critical rush, but you want to get it in before you get to that end of that 45 minutes. And at when we wait 45 minutes, we're not gonna demold that. No, there's a there's a demold time, which I think technically this comes to full strength in like 24 hours, but we'll be able to open it by tomorrow morning. Okay, so we're gonna wait a day. Take, demold it, and then get the casting. Yep. Yeah. Good morning, Frank. Hello. All right, these look like solid, solid molds. Solid rubber. Oh, wow. Okay, um, they're ready to open? Yeah, I uh, just gotta pull the pins out mm -hmm. and pull that, the plaster off. Okay. How do you feel about these molds so far um, as looking at them? They, they bowed a little bit, um, which, uh, drop the level of silicone, but mm -hmm. it's not perfect. These probably should have been done in uh, wood yep. so that it wouldn't do that, but it'll be fine. Because they're pretty tall. Yeah. But, you know, like this is one of those cases where you have to judge, like, are you saving time or mm -hmm. are you saving money? Like, there's right. ways to make these molds using less rubber. Right. It's just more time consuming. Um, a lot of times I have to do things where we need the part tomorrow morning. So make a big block of silicone. Now, if, for example, a silicone did recede to a level where you're still seeing some of the object, mm -hmm. right? Could you add more silicone yeah. and wait another day? It's not ideal, but yeah, you can. Heavy. Nice. All right. So we can tear off the foam core now. Yep. Okay. So we got these blocks of silicone out. Uh, we got to remove the original object. Yeah. What's the proper process for demolding? Well, the first thing I usually do is kind of clean up the mold so you don't have all these uh, little bits of rubber hanging off the edges. Mm. I just I like taking care in my molds, making them nice and pretty. Yeah. Part of that is also when you have those rigid walls, you want that's why you want the, the mm -hmm. flat sides, yep. flat edges for for storing and for casting. Yep. Just want a big block. Makes it easy when it's just a block. Okay, uh, cleaned up molds. I can see on the bottom, um, yeah, that's the base of the hammer, and that's that axe, yep. and that's the post. Yep. Cool. Um, these are pretty straightforward. We're just gonna cut them in half this way. Some Sometimes um, you have to really pay attention to like crazy curves and stuff, which gets into doing these, these tricky jeweler's cuts, um, but they're just gonna be in half, so it's kind of simple. Um, usually what I'll do is I know that this is in half, so I'll start by just giving a big zigzag. Mm -hmm. So that way when the mold comes back together, it has some kind of registration so that right. it doesn't misalign. Where if you were creating a two-part mold, you have to build in the registration with divots as you're making each half. Yeah. Ah, okay. um, so, uh, and I know that, you know, the hammer handle, like I have a bunch of room on either side, so I make real big cuts. Um, I've seen a lot of people will just cut it straight in half and that's fine. You can get a piece out, but it'll start to misalign if there's no registration. Now, ideally, do you want as few, as a small cut as possible? I know the shape of the hammer is irregular. You have a big top, but if it was something like what we did earlier, like the, the lightsaber or mm -hmm. something, where it's just more cylindrical, then would you need to not cut it in half? Um... Just to well, pull you, it out? You, you still, you can't pull it out because there's ridges on the lightsaber. Uh, so it, you know, you're gonna need to cut it. You don't want to damage the yeah. inside of the mold. But you want to have the slice on the part to be 90 degrees right where it touches, and then after that you want to have registration. So, um, so I'll usually just do a straight cut straight out of the part, and then after that I'll zigzag everything.
Okay, demolded. Yeah. That was a process. Um, yeah, it's a little tricky. Um, I've done it a lot because I used to work in the toy industry. Mm -hmm. If you look up on YouTube um, how to do a jeweler's cut, which is kind of what this is, kind of a modified jeweler's cut, um, it'll show you a little bit more of the intricacies of how you make the registration and kind of how to do that. But Is it more important to have good registration around the size of the mold or more important that the contact between your object be a smooth line? Um, it's, it's both. I mean, it's just like a tricky technique to learn, um, to, to really perfect it. Like, anybody can take a knife and cut a mold in half. Like, to make it so that it lines up really nice, repeatedly, um, that's a little tricky sometimes. Okay, all right, so let's talk about our casting material. Yeah. Foam. Foam. We're gonna use a self-skinning foam. Uh, it's Flex Foam at 17. Okay, uh, is this two parts again? Time yeah. to mix? Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at this foam. It looks like it's two parts B and one part A. Mm -hmm. And also, you prep the mold a bit because you know you're gonna be pouring the foam. You have a relatively short work time when yeah. you get in. So you taped up the molds yeah. to seal them. Uh, we've previously seen you tie rubber bands and wood boards around this. Mm -hmm. Is tape like the quick and dirty way to make sure it's closed? Yeah, I mean, really what you want to do is you want to make sure that no matter what way you're um, closing the mold and keeping it closed isn't going to deform the silicone. Sometimes a rubber band will squeeze it in a different direction than you want it to. With this tape, I can kind of control which direction it's squeezing by how I tension the tape when mm -hmm. I go around. Um, and then this, this strapping tape with this little strings in it doesn't stretch, so it's kind of nice and it just stays firm where it is. Got it. Different pound densities of foam expand at different rates. Mm -hmm. um, a lower density foam, which is a squishier foam, like a three pound density, expands a lot because you think about that material needs to foam a lot of little bubbles to make it squishy. Right. When you have a denser foam, like this one's a 17 pound foam, it's not as squishy, so it, the material doesn't expand as much. And then also you have to, if you put too much material, then it'll build up pressure, which might blow out the mold, um, if you don't have enough back pressure, then it doesn't form a nice good skin. So there's like, there's still like little tricks to getting polyfoams to work well. Um, and a lot of that comes from experience, just using a bunch of different ones and screwing castings up over time. So uh, don't be afraid to screw up some polyfoam castings. Okay, the foam is mixed. You're pouring a little bit at a time. Um, you want to kind of get it in there. Um, you know, the, like these specific foams have pretty good work times, but you can probably, that's probably good. Um, maybe not, maybe it needs more. But you're not filling it all to the top because you know it's, it's going to expand. expand, yeah. Okay, at this point, is there any need to seal it up or we just leave it no, here? No, on this one, I'm going to wait until it, it rises up a little bit and then I'm just going to put my thumb on the end mm -hmm. so that I get a little bit of back pressure to maybe force foam mm. up. But, but it's, you can actually see it. It's expanding it's right expanding now in slowly. the mold. It's, yeah. like it's, it's rising up through the mold. Yeah, here it's just about to come out. Yeah, it's like a little bit of a, a cake. Yeah. It's a souffle. You don't need to put back pressure on this one. There it goes. Wow, look at that. Expanding foam. Ooh, look at this marshmallow, Frank. Don't eat it. Don't eat it? Nope. Don't eat it. Also, wear gloves. Wear gloves. Wear gloves. Yeah, it's sticky. Um, clearly, it's popping up here, so... Yep. That will be easy, just to slice off mm -hmm. when that pops out. Uh, you were a little worried about filling this mold. Tell me what that was about. Yeah, getting getting the material to drip down through this real skinny neck. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's tricky, so I'm not sure how well this filled. Yeah. Hopefully it'll come out good. Uh, if not, we'll just pour another. Okay. And then you are putting your hand on top, just so to give it a little bit of back pressure. In, yeah. Push the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and this side here, where the post was, yeah. didn't fill all the way up. But you were well, using I didn't, it. I didn't need it to fill because all it, all I needed to make sure is that uh, some material came out, so that way I know that this tip um, got material into it. Right. So it reached all the way down mm -hmm. in, here. So you were yeah. shining a flashlight down in here to see yeah. if you can see the material. Okay. Um, and then how long should we wait until uh, we demold? Maybe about a half an hour or so. Yeah. All right. Can't maybe we'll wait. demold after lunch. All right. Good bake. Good bake. Hey, foam tools. Yeah, they came out all right. This I seems think they totally did. Perfect. The uh, axe <laughs> is a, a little, little floppy. A little limp. Okay. But, um, uh, a lesson learned, a lesson remembered. That's, yeah, I, I should have put um, a rod in there mm. to keep it steady, but I forgot. Yeah, and for a rod, you can use. Oh, you can use metal, wood, plastic. Yeah, whatever you want. Some anything rigid. A chopstick would yes. work. Yes. Totally. Yeah, and all you got to do is just. Put it in there as the foam is running. Uh, or if you had made a, a two-part mold, you could set it in. There's all kinds of ways. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So, but let's talk about this hammer then, because you can tell Fidelity, uh, even this little imprint on the mm -hmm. hammer made it. And when we're talking about a self-skinning foam, it doesn't even look porous. Yeah. Yeah, and any of this texture detail here, that's all from the actual hammer itself. Yeah. Um, seam lines look pretty clean too. They're okay. I mean, it wasn't the, the best closed up mold, mm -hmm. um, but it's good. I mean, for making a, you're making a, a rubber prop that's supposed to be a stand-in for a hero. So if you were filming something and you needed to throw this at the camera guy, I wouldn't yeah. throw the real hammer. That's right. And throw the rubber one. Now, is there enough uh, detail, surface detail, that you're gonna bring out some stuff with the paint job? Yeah, I think this will paint up really nice. All and, right. I mean, this is pretty worn in, so it's pretty dark, mm. um, but it'll be fun. Okay, let's talk about painting then. Um, I mean, we're just gonna paint this like we normally paint anything. Start off with some washes of brown and just start building it up. Um, there's these metals, uh, these metallic colors in here. I got some uh, metallics that we'll, we'll put in and just start painting it. Start painting. Yeah. All right. I could tell the difference at a first glance, which one's real and which one's a foam one. Well, at a quick glance, and I mean, it, but you know, they're, they're stunt copies. So yes. They're for uh, fun. But it's amazing with the paint job um, that the hammer here looks so much like the original. Yeah. So talk me through the paint job. Um, I mean, it's basically just building up washes like we've done a ton of times before. On the hammer, we, I put down some, some silvery gray and then just kind of started building up some of the rusty colors. With the handle, I, um, I started with some browns some reds and browns, and I used my brush strokes to kind of create the wood grain, um, even though I knew that a lot of that was gonna get covered over with a lot of the dirt that's already on the hammer. Um, you wanna have that like first layer of, you know, it being kind of accurate, and then build up the gunk afterwards. And the direction of the grain, which you can see shows up, mm -hmm. even like at the end, after mm -hmm. you put the gunk on, it was different between the two pieces. Well, the other one, it's like, it's, it's, it's a wrap. It, yeah, it's kind of like a wrap thing. So I, I wanted it to kind of keep that going. Um, I could probably spend a little bit more time on the handle of this one, put the stripes in and put a gloss on there and stuff like that. But for, you know, for a quick kind of thrown together paint job, that took me what, 15 minutes yeah. to do these two. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's what you can do. And then in uh, your thought process for adding the gunk, yeah. so you're looking back and forth, seeing where the, the silver still popped up. How do you differentiate between letting the first coat show versus adding another coat? Well, I'm sort of tackling this as though I was working on a film and I had to make a replica prop. You know, the, the stunt prop and the hero prop. So I'm just trying to copy pretty much exactly what I see. Like where there's dark spots, add some dark spots. Where there's light spots, add some light spots. Um, I mean, you, you mimic something that's already existing in real life, you're gonna get like a more realistic finish. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, definitely a lot of colors in here. It's not just brown. Mm -hmm. Silver and black. I mean, if you look at the table here, you got different colors of brown. You get a little more red. Yeah. You got to put in the. There's rust. probably some oranges I can throw into that into the rust, to kind of bring a couple more spots out. But for the most part, yeah. And then you still have a mold left that you can make yeah. multiple copies. Make a couple of them. All right, there you go, making foam prop replicas, stunt props for <laughs> in this case workshop tools, but it's a process. Yeah, we'll put this in the toolbox and see if anybody tries to hammer oh, something with it. Toss it to someone. Out there, um, but there's a process that you can use for any type of problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, thanks, Frank, for showing us 
molding casting, a foam prop. Uh, if you have other projects you have to see, we're gonna come back to the shop. We also have more on the site for our premium community, so check that out. But till next time, more props.